At the same time, would you open your Bibles to the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, the great movie Shawshank Redemption. How many have seen that film? Okay. Maybe I should ask you differently. How many have not seen it? Okay, a few of you. I failed you as a parent. I'm sorry. Yeah, here's what I know. Uh, the statute of limitations on a spoiler alert ran out 20, like 15 years ago. So if you haven't seen it, you're like, oh, you just spoiled it. I was going to watch it. That's on you, not me, okay? You had like, what, 25, 30 years to see this thing? So that's not my fault. But there's a line in this film, uh, one of the main characters, Morgan Freeman, who uh, I would love to narrate my life, uh, at one point says he's been in prison his whole life, and he says, hope is a dangerous thing. And uh, he, he thought he was talking about prison, but he wasn't. He was talking about fly fishing. That's where I just got back from. And hope is dangerous there because you have one great experience and you think it's going to happen again. I'm going to crush this river one more time. And I, uh, I, I told my Chris of Roman about how awesome fishing was on this river because I had a great experience in 2014. Okay. So, and I've been there back many times and sometimes great experiences, sometimes not, but I'm, oh man, you're going to love it. You're going to crush it. And this is what Chris uh, did. Um, <laughs> hope is a dangerous thing. There's two reasons why the guide themselves wants you to take a picture of a fish. One, it's a hog. Like you've just caught a porpoise out of the river. The other reason they want to take a picture, I'm talking like the guides themselves, is because that's the smallest fish they've ever seen on the river, and they want to go show it to the other guys and sit around dinner and laugh about it. That's what happened with Chris Roman's fish. Hope uh, was a dangerous thing for trout fishing this past week for Chris Roman. So, uh, we're not talking about a fishing guide for a falling world. We're talking about a field guide for a fallen world. And I want to read to you this morning from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, speaking specifically about whether or not hope is a dangerous thing. So verse 3, I'm just going to read verses 3 through 9, especially when I'm in 1 Peter and not 2 Peter. Praise be to the God... And Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, where am I at? There it is. Somebody was helping me. <laughs> Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is already that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 6. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That's God's word, let's pray. Heavenly Father, give us wisdom this morning. We're asking for it. We're not wavering. We're asking for wisdom. And we know that when you said that in the book of James, that you'll give it to us. Grant us the light of your word to light the steps underneath of us and the path ahead of us. Thank you for your promises that are so true in that situation. Lord, I ask for you this morning. We were with Pastor John Stearns this last week who just transitioned his church, Franklin Vineyard, to uh, Grant Pemberton. Pray that you be with the vineyard this morning. They're transitioning. It's always a hard time, but oh boy, our town needed a good uh, transition, and that's been a great transition, and we're so grateful. We give you praise for that. Pray that you just specially blessed Vineyard Franklin this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So in this movie, The Shawshank Redemption, right, there's the character of Andy Dufresne who was falsely accused and framed and thrown in prison. And then you've got Ellis Red Redding, who I learned this morning in the Stephen King version of this novel turned out to not be uh, a black guy, but actually an Irish guy. I didn't know that, but they Morgan Freeman. If you got Morgan Freeman, that's who your Red is. And he, at the moment of uh, early on in the movie, he, he tells Andy, who's thinking about getting out of here someday, man, hope is the dangerous thing. And at the end of the movie, if you, I guess I'll just spoil it, Andy escapes that movie. We're like, oh my God, I can't believe he did that. That's so crazy. How do you know? We, the whole movie was about that. But at the end of it, he sends a letter to Red, invites him to meet him down in Mexico. And that letter says, and don't forget, hope is a good thing. Maybe even the best of things and good things never die. Now the question is, who's right? Is it red or is it Andy? And 1 Peter 2 tells us neither. Because a hope that is a false hope or a, a hope that is no hope at all, hopelessness, neither one are good. But 1 Peter tells us that false hope or hopelessness is replaceable with living hope. And that's different. What First Peter is telling us, what he's telling us today is that there is a living hope that is available to you. It's available to me. And living hope, unlike false hope, unlike hopelessness, living hope is genuine. Like it's real. You don't have to pretend or put your head in the sand. There's living hope that's durable. It can withstand whether your circumstances are good or whether your circumstances are bad, your hope is not dependent upon that. And that living hope is not binding you up. Living hope is liberating you. That's what we're going to talk about in these next few moments. A living hope that is genuine. It's alive, right? Praised to the Father of uh, our Lord Jesus, his great mercy. He's giving us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our hope isn't what our hope is who. Living hope. That's why Buddhists, they don't have living hope. They got a dead hope. You can pay 10 bucks and go visit their hope. His grave is still there. Mohammed is dead hope. You can pay, it's probably a whole lot more than that, to go see the grave of Muhammad. They know where it is. You can buy a ticket to it. Jesus resurrected from the dead. I've been to Israel. I don't know how many of you have been to Israel. Please continue to pray for Israel. But you know what? You can go to Israel and you can't pay 10 bucks to see a grave with Jesus in it because he gone. He gone. <laughs> and here's what I know. And if you're Catholic, God bless you. Here's what I know. If he were still there, the Catholics would have built a church on top of it and charged you a hundred bucks to go see it. Okay? They know how to venerate something. I mean, look, we were in Venice. Remember, Shannon, we were in Venice and we were at one of the little cathedrals there and there's a little box with the thumb of St. Thomas. I don't remember how much we paid for that too much. Because when I ask him, are you sure this is uh, St. Thomas's thumb? Probably. Like they don't know. They just charging money to see it. It looked like it was a little thumb bone. But my point is, is if Jesus's body was still there, somebody would have venerated it. Somebody would have built a church on top of it and you'd go visit it. But you can't because he's not, because he's alive and because he's a living hope, not a dead hope. Now, here's why that matters. <laughs> Because a living hope is my buddy Pasong on the far left, okay? A living guide is the best way to hike to Everest Base Camp. Ethan and I will be taking this journey on September 12th. First of all, we're going to go to Nepal. We're going to spend a few days in the south and visit the school. Uh, we have somehow managed, by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, we are a school in Nepal that is fully, to my knowledge, the only one fully uh, uh, acknowledged by the government, legally allowed by the government, but it is a Christian school, not a Hindu school in the middle of Nepal. So we're going to do that first. And then we're going to hike to base camp at Everest because it sounded like a good idea a few years ago. Now I'm like, man, that's the closer it's getting. I was like, that is the dumbest thing I've ever done. But this on the left is Pasong and Pasong is my living guide. Okay. Now, I could get a map. I could go on the YouTube, and I have, 
and see the ways to get to base camp and all. But here's what I can't find. I, I need a living guide. I need a guide that can tell me this is the tea house you should go to. These are the foods you should avoid. This is the bucket you should go to the bathroom in. This is the one you should wash in. I don't know any of those things, but a living guide, Pasong, knows those things. And that's the promise of a living hope. We have this book, right? We have this guide, but God did not give us a manual. He gave us Emmanuel, God with us. He is our living guide, our living hope. That's way better than a set of instructions. If I go to a car mechanic, I am as worthless and hopeless as anyone at a car mechanic. You could tell me whatever you want. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. The bulb, it's all ball bearings these days. Right? I don't know. So I, I have no hope there. I need a guide. I need a mechanic that I can trust, a mechanic that can guide me through this process. Could I figure it out with a YouTube video and a piece of paper? Probably. But you know what's a lot better is a living mechanic that is trustworthy, that can guide the process and get me through it. The living hope is alive and it's not dead. And Jesus is not a dead guide. He's an alive guide. And he has been here once and he's coming back again. And our journey right now is technically kind of like our journey to base camp. We just need a guide to get us from his first appearance to his next appearance, his last appearance. And he will guide us through that. He is not left you alone. I will never, ever leave you. I will never, ever forsake you. It is a living hope, right? And then it's not, right? It's, it's, it's durable. Like it lasts. It holds the test of time. I, I love this passage because it talks about how this hope started thousands of years before. The prophets were talking about it. They didn't see it. If you read Hebrews 11, right? You see that this hope survived thousands of years in the face of terrible circumstances because they had they didn't see the promise yet. That's what Hebrews 11 is all about. In fact, Hebrews 11, it actually talks about that, uh, like the first few verses, this one conquered nations, this one took over cities, this one was killing lions. And then literally, there's not even a break in that sentence about halfway through. And this one was killed by lions. This one was killed by the sword. This one was defeated. Both are in there. Both are okay because both are in faith and their faith wasn't in their circumstance. Their faith is in the hope of the one that is to come. You can't have a joy in circumstance, a hope in circumstance, if the circumstance is your hope and the circumstance goes away, then your joy goes away. Your hope goes away. And many, many, many in the West, our Hope is our circumstance, not in outside of our circumstance. So when the circumstance changes, our hope leaves. If you travel with me, and I pray that you get to at some point to Haiti, to Africa, to Asia, one thing you'll see, how many of you have traveled in those places before? What do you notice immediately? The joy the inexpressible joy. Olivia was with us in Africa. There's the kids. And you look at the joy and you look at the situation and you're like, how is it possible they're so joyful? Their circumstances are so terrible. It's because their joy is not their circumstance. Their joy supersedes their circumstance. There's another thought on this. I, 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 I don't have that much time for this, so I encourage you to go back and, and maybe read this later. If you've, how many of you have read uh, Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning? Four of you, good. So this is highly recommend. Uh, Victor Frankl survived Nazi uh, Holocaust uh, uh, concentration camps, but he went into it as a psychologist. And because he's a psychologist, he was doing his work while in the camp. And one of the things he was talking about was hope that isn't a durable hope because there are different kinds. In fact, he sort of, he puts it into four categories of people that were in these camps and based upon which one they fell into was whether or not they would survive the camp. The first category of people that had been in a horrible circumstance. By the way, I bring this up specifically because if you were sold a bill of goods that we were always going to live in a country that was pro-Christ, pro-Christian, pro, that was not promised to us. And I have not done a great job of preparing us for potential 
for what is currently persecution that could increase and ramp up. I pray it doesn't. But if it does, we still have a living hope. Peter, remember, was writing this not to the church in Dallas, right? This was to the church in Asia Minor. They were suffering immensely. Caesar Nero was on the move, torturing, taking their homes, taking their goods. And he's talking about things like inexpressible joy in the middle of all that. So back to Viktor Frankl. He says, there's these four kinds of people who live in horrible situations, and this is your choice. One, there are those who just become brutal, brutal. And he's talked about people in the book that they, they're the same people. They're other fellow Jews. And instead of being on the same team, they responded with brutality, which is a wild thought, but it was everywhere inside of, uh, of these concentration camps. The second kind is those who just gave up. They lost hope all together. Their hope wasn't durable. And I just want to read this. He says, usually this happened quite suddenly. The symptoms which were familiar to us who had been at Auschwitz for a while, we all feared for this moment in our friends. Usually it began one morning when the prisoner simply refused to get dressed or wash or go out to the parade grounds for inspection. No entreaties, no blows, no threats had any effect. They had just given up. Nothing bothered them anymore because they had no hope. Now, for the record, in our country right now, hopelessness is a crisis. Our uh, climate change warriors... This is just from, this is literally from an article this week. This, and you wonder why our teenagers, right now there's a mental health crisis in our teenagers. If this is what our white coat experts are saying, it's hopeless. We live in an age of fools. It's hopeless and broken. I worry about the future my children are inheriting. That's what they're hearing, the hopelessness of it. That, that's a horrible, they've given up hope. And so how, how would our teenagers act any differently? And it's not just teenagers. It's young adults. It's old people. The hopelessness coming from government, from media, is being transferred into our children. Now, I might ask you this. This is easy. This is low-hanging fruit because most of us in this room, oh, yeah, the climate justice warriors, all that. But in our country, in our city specifically, There's a lot of friends in here, a lot of people in here. You are very, very, very convinced. You're very committed to your political candidate that you want to win. And when, if and when they don't, if they do win, you celebrate. If they don't win, you're apoplectic. Your children are watching. You can convey seriousness without transferring anxiety. And I'm begging you to check yourself on that. Your candidate might win. Awesome. Congratulations. I've been doing this for, I'm 53 years. And I'll tell you, I had candidates that I thought were great and candidates I thought were terrible. And they both kept spending money. Our country is still somehow $32 trillion in debt with Republican Demo- and, and Democrats. I, but my point is, is that's a, a serious true thing. But don't Transfer your anxiety into your children. This hopelessness is happening inside of the workplace. It's happening in teenagers. It's happening in the economy. Hopelessness is everywhere. And that is not a God standard at all. We have a hope, a living hope. And in Auschwitz, hopelessness was killing them. He actually has multiple examples of people that when they gave up hope, they would physically die, not necessarily just from the beatings. They would die from typhoid. They would weaken their immune systems. And now modern day science tells us the body keeps the score. If you're carrying your anxiety more than you're carrying the Holy Spirit, your body is going to pay the price for it. You don't have to. You don't have to succumb to hopelessness because that's not the promise of the Bible. The promise is in your circumstance, you can still have hope. You don't have to give up hope. The third kind was this, if I can just survive, when I get out, I can now get everything back that I lost. My position, my finances, my marriage, my family. I can get it all back if I can survive. They put their hope in that. And Dr. Frankel, after he survived, continued to follow up with those who had that kind of hope. And you know what he found? 
the suicide rate was through the roof with those people. Depression was through the roof with those people because what happened was, uh, it says, many held on long enough, this is from one of his writings, many held on through the hope that if they stayed alive, their health, family, personal achievements, fortune, position in society, those things, listen, those things that had been their hope would be restored. If they could just stay alive, they could get those things back. But after liberation, many people found that when the day their dreams came true, it wasn't what they expected. They went into depressions, suicide. They'd even discussed ahead of time that this could happen, and it still happened because they put their hope in their things, and it wasn't enough to bear the weight of their needs. And then there was this fourth. And the fourth is what he would call a foundation, that he would say this life only has a meaning if we have a hope and a meeting that even suffering and death can't destroy. I'm going to say it one more time. We have a hope and a meaning that even suffering and death can't destroy. He said only a few people were able to stay kind, buoyant, not happy, of course, but they kept their inner liberty. And you know what? Here's what he's saying. The foundation of who you are, your personality, your life, it's your hope, your future, whatever your ultimate hope of your heart is, is what is going to shape and form your heart. If it's in God, in Jesus, it will transform it. If it's in anything else, it will warp and deform it. It's really powerful. And that's what Peter is telling us. There is a hope that is durable, that gold, right? Gold is actually made stronger, right? Gold is made clearer and brighter by fire. And the fire is the suffering. The fire is the persecution, but even it will perish. If our hope is in anything but Christ and his return, his making all things new, then your hope is not durable. It won't last. And what I'm asking us to check our own heart is because our hearts right now, there's many options for us to put our hope in. I'm not suggesting we don't have a plan. I'm not suggesting we don't vote. I'm not suggesting that we don't even get involved with our voices at government level. I am suggesting the Bible is commanding us to not put our hope in those things. If you enter into any sort of public service like that, you're trying to fix everything out here without first allowing Christ to fix everything in here, then you're just one more version of somebody warping a culture based in my image, not in his image. Please, my brothers and sisters, let that living hope be a hope that transcends everything except Christ himself, or that Christ himself would transcend everything that you would put your hope in. It's also liberating. When I say liberating and then I read this passage, you're like, mm, that doesn't sound very liberating. Be holy as I am holy. Put away all the evil things, the desires you had when you lived in ignorance. That doesn't sound very freeing, except that you were designed, I was designed to live to be a certain way, the way that God has designed us to be. That's it. It's so what is not liberating, right? What, let me put it differently. If freedom really means I can do whatever I want. That's what a two-year-old thinks freedom means. Right? If I live my life saying freedom is whatever I want, I can do whatever I want, wherever I want. And look, I moved to Marshall County, okay? It's a lawless swamp down there. And I love every minute of it. Put my American flag up. Like I can do whatever I want. I was crazy. But freedom also says that I need to be a good neighbor, right? I, freedom, even in Marshall County, means that we've gotta, there's got to be some standards here. And those standards, you can come from the government, whatever. My standards come from right here. And freedom, freedom doesn't mean I get to me eat as many chips as I want, okay? Trust me, I've tried. <laughs> and I've learned something. I can't outrun a French fry. I have all the freedom. I can eat all the fries I want, and I'm going to pay the price for that. I've been paying it the last few months, especially trying to get rid of those fries. Might as well just duct tape them to my butt because that's where they were going. 
let's just save you the journey. I'll just duct tape this gallon of ice cream to my rear end because that's where it's going anyway. No, freedom was not about that. If my freedom was based on every impulse I ever had, short-term impulse, that becomes slavery, not freedom. Ask any alcoholic, ask any addict of any kind, they had the freedom to do whatever they wanted and that freedom turned them into slaves, not free people. Now my freedom is not to live however I want. Freedom is living how I was designed. I was designed by the God of the universe. And in that design, he says, one man, one woman, that's the design. And when I step into that design, there's so much freedom in that. There's so much freedom in living the way God wanted us to be and designed us to be. It's actually a great gift when you think about how God, I just, God is so kind because the way he designed us is then the way he asks us to live to begin with. For instance, as a man, how many of you have read Wild at Heart? Right? Great book. I love it. I've read it multiple times. Caleb and I read it together. A couple of you in this room, we went through it together. But one of the things that Eldridge points out is that men specifically, we were designed for adventure. Adventure. And what is the first thing that Western culture does? It castrates you. It wants you to be just very simple and safe and and it kills men inside, right? But that said, he wants you to have adventure. And then he says, go into every nation, preach the gospel, make disciples. You know how adventurous that is? I mean, you can ask LaFleur, we've had some adventures. I mean, we've flown on a couple of planes that were held together with duct tape and hope. And not living hope, like duct tape hope. You know, I was like, oh, God, please. <laughs> but let me tell you what. Like, we're going to land, you and me, Ethan, we're going to land at Lukla Airport, the most dangerous airport on the planet. Sorry, Shannon, could you cover yours? Um, don't Google it. But I'm telling you what, when you land there and everybody claps, now normally I, get, I make fun of people when we clap, when we land, whatever. Not that one. Standing ovation. We did it. That's amazing. The adventure is there. But it, the point is, is that the very thing that God designed me to need is the very thing required to fulfill the call of God on my life. How awesome is God? If the very thing I needed was to be safe, the very thing I needed was to be locked up in a room and completely protected and safe, and then he says, go out into all the world, then he's asking me to do something that's the opposite of the way that I was designed. That's a cruel God. But we serve a good God. He's invited us into that adventure. So put that to work and however your heart is, but whatever God is calling you to do, I've, it's not that it's going to be happy all the time. Paul Right, Paul was in jail half the time, but I've been to some of the places Paul's been. You know, some of the, he saw some amazing things along the way. You see some beautiful things. You guys, I mean, Kayla, you've gone to Uganda with us, and you stand on top of Murchison Falls. It looks like God just flushed his toilet. Like, how on the bottom? This is the biggest waterfall I've ever seen. It's amazing. It's adventure. It's beautiful. You see amazing things along the way because God designed you for that. That's why living hope is a liberating hope, not a binding hope. Liberating hope doesn't put you in rehab. Liberating hope puts you in transformation. And that's the God that we serve. And if you will follow that living guide. You see, Chris, the only difference between the last time we went to Montana and this time we went to Montana with Chris Roman was we had a guide that knew what he was doing. This wasn't just a guy rowing a boat. You got to put your, if you're going to have a guide, you better make sure that guide is a good guide. You better make sure that guide has been there before. That guide knows what he's doing. And this time, redemption happened for Chris Roman. The trout slayer. But the only difference between a year ago and today, but between, you know, he caught a guppy last year for the fishbowl back home, was that he had a guide that had been there before and knew what he was doing. You and I serve a guide that has been there, is there, and will be there. In fact, the way that Peter unfolds this is that he was there before the foundations of the earth. That this living hope doesn't end when you breathe your last breath this side of heaven. This is forever. 
It says there that he was before the foundations of the earth, like before that he was already planned for this. He was there 2,000 years ago. He's there today. He lives outside of time. And since you call, verse 17, on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time here as foreigners, here in reverent fear, for you know it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty... The gospel writers wrote short sentences, but Peter, you talk, the king of run on sentences was Peter. Or gold that you were redeemed from the empty, you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors, handed down to you from legacy media, handed down to you from American culture. You have been redeemed from that empty way of life, not with gold that could perish, but with the precious blood of Christ a lamb without blemish or defect. That's our living hope. He paid way too big of a price for you to squander that. Steward that living hope well. When you see the news, here's the thing, false hope, there's two options there. False hope says, uh, uh, false hope says, oh, I'm just gonna ignore it. False hope False hope is a lot of the things you hear on Joe Rogan. It's going to be okay because we figured this out before. We'll figure it out again, okay? That's like saying to Chris Roman, yeah, I caught a large trout last year. You're going to catch a big one this year, okay? Maybe, but it's not based on any fact. That's a false hope. False hope is that... (laughs) False hope is every every year, uh, 10 years, whatever, if you put your money in a mutual fund, you're going to get uh, 10%. I know you, Dave... Damn. Dave Ramsey's cussing in church. Dave Ramsey. <laughs> I, I'm on so little sleep. <laughs> He's right that in the last few years or decades, right, that the, it's, I think it's 10% Ramsey people, correct me, 10, 12% that you're going to average on a 401k, that that's what, you know, that's what history teaches us. That's true, except that's not what history teaches us. That's what the last 100 years teaches us. History teaches us that great nations rise and great nations fall, right? So yeah, make a plan, right? But don't put your hope in the plan. Make a plan and put your hope in the plan, the guy that keeps the plans. I got to get you out of here. Hope is forever because it's paid for with the blood of Jesus. There's hope for you. Young people, don't ignore the circumstances in front of you. You don't have to put your head in the sand. That's false hope. Also, don't get so overwhelmed with the circumstances in front of you, right? That's putting your trust in the circumstances. But if you put your trust in the one who controls the circumstances, not in the circumstance, then Peter's writing to a group of people, talks about inexpressible joy in the middle of their suffering, in Haiti, inexpressible joy in the middle of their suffering. Are they suffering? Are they crying? Is there sadness? Yes. And is there joy that is just unexplainable? Yes. I don't know what's going to happen in our culture or in our country. I don't. I don't know who's going to win. I don't know who's going to lose. And the sooner you come to the conclusion that I am coming to now that it doesn't matter because Jesus is on the throne. It doesn't matter because the living hope is in Jesus. That's why it has to be true that way because if it's not true in every situation, it's not true in any situation. That's the gospel. If it can't be true for a slave in Pakistan, then it can't be true for an investment banker on Wall Street. It has to be true in every situation. And that is that if we put our hope in anything other than a living hope. It's not durable. It's not eternal. It doesn't last. It's going to buckle under the pressure. The only one who can bear the weight of our hope is the one, the guide that has gone ahead of us to show us our way out. That's how we're going to get on and off that mountain in Nepal is I've got a guide. He's been there before. He's there right now. He'll be there when we get there. He'll keep us alive and he'll get us to where we're going. Jesus, our living hope, will get us there. Stand and let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have given us a living hope. Not a manual, not like an Ikea instructions book. You've given us Emmanuel, God with 
us the word. You became flesh. You dwelt among us. You came the first time. You're coming a second time. And that is our living hope. You're going to get us off this mountain alive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.